when you are lonely or sorrowful or depressed or hurting or distraught or angry or struggling or in any sin, what should you do? Well, probably you're going to say you should pray. The question is, if you should pray, why? Are you asking God to then help or to intervene in some way, shape, or fashion? Well, the question then is, how will he do so? The reason why I'm asking this question is because people have decided, I don't know if they've done so, done so intentionally or unintentionally, they have placed a high view of their free will, and you believe that God will not violate that. And if that is the case, then why then would you pray? Why would you ask for him to intervene? Because in order for him to intervene, doesn't that mean he would have to enforce his will upon or over your will? People say things like this. The Holy Spirit will not violate our free will, though it's not actually in the Bible. That's nowhere in the Bible yet. People say that. Or maybe you've heard it said this way. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. What, what does that even mean? What does that mean to say the Holy Spirit is a gentleman? He will only ask for your permission. Could you imagine having a God that only asks for our permission? That's not very godlike. Now, I don't know what it's like to be a God. I do know what it's like to be someone who's subservient or someone to have authority over. And the person in the higher authority does not really ask for permission, especially if you're God. We don't see that really in the Bible, God asking for permission to intervene. And so I think people view the spirit more as an advisor who simply offers up recommendations or advice. Many have unintentionally or some intentionally have reduced the Holy Spirit's power from the power of God to the power of suggestion, the power of persuasion. Is that what the Holy Spirit is? He merely suggests, he gives advice, trying to hopefully persuade? No. What's happening is we have this question and we've got the question backwards. We tend to ask, do we have free will? That's not really the question. And I understand what free will is meant by meaning that we have volition. But to think that our will is not inhibited by or controlled by or influenced by or altered by or motivated by something, that's just false. That is incorrect. But more importantly, the question shouldn't be, do we have free will? The question should be, does the Lord have free will? And then the next question is, what does he do with that free will? So let's look at some passages. The Bible tells us that it, it's in him, in him that we live and move and exist. I think sometimes we get that backwards. It's that it's in us that he lives and moves and has his being. No, we are in him. And so the other point that needs to be made is that the Holy Spirit does have the ability to stop things, to move things. The question is when and how. Looking at Acts 16, 6, remember they tried to uh, move somewhere and the Holy Spirit prevented them. In this particular passage, they say that they were pa passing through, they tried to pass through uh, Phrygian and the Galatian region, having been forbidden or prevented by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Well, so the Holy Spirit gets credit for preventing something. Also, we see that it is God ultimately who is at work in us, obviously by the power of his Holy Spirit in, in Philippians 2.13, for it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The Lord is working in us for his good pleasure. It is the Lord's job. And how does he do so? By means of the Holy Spirit. He says in 1 John 4.4, 4, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Well, who is the he that's in us? The he is the Holy Spirit. He is working in us. That is his job. That is what he does. Matt, more to the point, it's his prerogative. Now, does that mean that we don't have any way to resist or we can't do anything of our own? Sure. We are told in Ephesians 4.30, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Well, what does it mean to grieve? Well, the word grieve simply means, the Greek word means to suppress, to push back against. Do we have the ability at time to push back? Sure we do. Now, does that mean that he didn't have the ability to push back even more so? Sure. And what, what's the result of our pushing back? discipline. Uh, we learn a lesson or we may allow things to happen because God will use all sorts of means, not just by moving in us to cause us to do certain things, but he also take other means, some outside means as well. Maybe the tree falls on this road and you are forced to turn that way. Maybe your job is lost. Maybe something with your health is taken away. 
various different ways that God can go about moving us. But rest assured, ultimately, it is the Holy Spirit who is at work in us. Remember, it's Job who says, shall we only praise God for the good and not for the bad? In other words, God is moving. God does things that we like and God does things that we don't like, sometimes uh, inwardly or outwardly, all ultimately by the power of the Holy Spirit. So clearly the ability is in us to grieve the Holy Spirit or to suppress it. But ultimately, that is it, that is if we are his will, the spirit will win out. Ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, the spirit will win out. How do we know so? Because Paul tells us that God is working in all those things. He causes all those things. We know this passage. He says, for we know that God causes all things to work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Well, how does he do so? Well, the only way for him to do so is through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the question is, that is, if you are his. If you are truly his, then you are. Uh, then this applies and God works in you. Remember, though, it's the if. If you are his, that means that you have been bought with a price, according to 1 Corinthians 6, 20. You have also been baptized into the spirit. Remember, John tells us, and then Jesus makes the same statement that John baptized with water, but it's Jesus who baptizes his sheep, his believers, into the Holy Spirit. Paul says that all of us in 1 Corinthians 12, 13 have been baptized into the spirit. He lives in us. As a matter of fact, not only does he live in us, he leads us according to Romans 8, verses 9 through 14, verses 9, he says, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. If we just shift, shift that just a little bit down to verse 14, for all who are being led by the spirit of God, these are the sons of God. If you're not being led by the spirit of God, you're not here. So he does lead, but he also, he sanctifies us according to Ephesians 5, 26. And he keeps us. The promises from God will be that he will cause his people to work in his commands. Remember, we're told this in I'm sorry, in Ezekiel 36, 27 it says, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe them. Now, are we going to do so perfectly? No, but ultimately we'll do it better and better and better. We will sin less and we will obey more perfectly. No, but the longer that we are with him, the more we walk with him, the better we get. Why? Because the spirit is working in us, as he says. And so the promises from God will be that he will cause his people, that if you are his people, to walk in his commands. We aren't told how he accomplishes this, but we are told that he will accomplish this. So rather than putting our focus on us and our and our will, we should instead put our focus on him and his will to keep us. Remember, he has been given, um, we have been given the Holy Spirit in us because of our faith as a down payment. Paul says uh, that in him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of, of your salvation, having also believed you were sealed in him, that is in Christ, with the Holy Spirit of promise. This Holy Spirit was given as a pledge for our inheritance for how long? With a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. And so he will be in us forever until we get to, until we receive our ultimate possession, which is heaven. And so rather than focusing on our will, which is fraught with problems, our will is fickle. Our will goes this way and that way up, down, and we still don't know which way we ought to go. Rather than focusing on our frail, fallen will, Let's focus on his will, because if his will comes in contact with our will, ultimately, who wins? It's not that we can say that our will overpowers him. No, his will overpowers us. If you disagree, some might. We don't have passages to tell us that our will will overcome his will. Ultimately, his will will be done. Amen. <laughs>